So good morning, Living Truth. We're celebrating a most awesome day today. We're celebrating Pentecost Sunday. What a day, what a time. Uh, I know that today being Pentecost Sunday, it's a little different. We're so used to being together. And you know, that does break my heart that we're not able to celebrate this day together. But I tell you right now, I look forward to next week. Don't stay home if you don't have to. Don't stay home next week. We're going to be here worshiping together. We're reopening next Sunday. And if you're at home, shout to the rooftops so that we can hear you this morning. We're so excited. Maybe post a little yay in the comment if you want to. Uh, and, and so we are so excited. We're finishing up preparations, getting ready for in this week, everything that's going to be started uh, on this next Sunday, worshiping together with all of you. So we look forward to it. I can't just, I can't contain myself about how excited I am to be together with all of you. So many great things that God has planned for each and every one of us in this moment, right now, in this time. You know, I want to share a message with you today, uh, obviously a Pentecost Sunday message with you. You know, the Bible says that uh, God is a God who answers by fire. And I know that there are probably times, and, and I've probably talked about this before, maybe even mentioned it before in other uh, services and sermons, uh, but I'm going to talk to you about the God who answers by fire from uh, 1 Chronicles 21. There's an interesting story there in 1 Chronicles 21 that I believe is very relevant to us as we move into this relaunch uh, and, and in from uh, Pentecost Sunday. I think Pentecost Sunday could be a launching point for us from our homes straight into corporate worship next Sunday with an expectation for God to do great and mighty things. And so let me set up 1 Chronicles 21 for you, and then we'll dig into the, the thoughts that I have here for you. So David in 1 Chronicles 21, now let me remind you about 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. These are, as they're said, they're chronicles. They are written after the exile based on the chronological time frame. Yeah, I know they come right after kings, but they are written to remind the children of Israel when they're coming out of their bondage to Babylon, when they're coming back in. This is to remind them of the greatness of the, the lineage of kings. It's to remind them of who David was and who God is and his promises with David. And, and so 1 Chronicles 21 is rehashing some things that happened while David was king. And what happened here is David took a census. Now, a census of counting the people, kind of like the time we're in right now with the U.S. census. David took a, sentence, a census and he counted the people. And God wasn't happy about this uh, census that was taken. And so God sent Gad the prophet to David to basically tell him, hey, you have messed up. You didn't do this right. This was not what I instructed. And so you get a choice of three different kinds of punishments. It says that uh, you can eat either, uh, what's it say here? It says that you can have three years of famine, you can have three months of, of losing battles and the sword of your enemy will overtake you, uh, or you could have three days of the sword of the Lord in pestilence upon the people. And David, in begging for mercy, he places his life in the hands of God rather than the hand of man. And so God on that day began to visit the people of Israel with a pestilence. And it says in, the, in Scripture that 70,000 men were killed. God was, in fact, sending an angel of the Lord through Israel, and he had a sword in his hand, and, and that was representing the pestilence. And so 70,000 men were being destroyed. And there is this one moment where the angel of the Lord was headed towards Jerusalem, and God saw this, and he tells the angel to stay his hand. Do not do any more damage. Hold it right there. Well, the Bible says that David happened to look up into the sky, between heaven and earth and he saw the angel of the Lord with his sword drawn and he freaks 
out. And he realizes that this is beyond uh, serious. So uh, the Bible says that he and the elders, they put on sackcloth, they got on their face before the Lord, they're crying out in mercy, and the angel of the Lord speaks to Gad, the prophet, and says to him, go to David, and here's what you need to tell him. He says, you need to go and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So the second part of of 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 21, we see that David goes to Ornan to, to talk to him about purchasing the threshing floor. And as they are discussing this, the, the purchase price, Ornan keeps saying, I'm going to give it to you, I'm going to give it to you, I'm going to give it to you. And David says, no, I will not take something that costs me nothing. And, and Ornan says, well, here, I'll throw on top of the field uh, to make this deal even sweeter that I'm giving to you. I'll even give you the, the cattle that I've been using and the tools that I've been using to plow this field. You can use the cattle for the sacrifice. You can use the tools for the wood, for the altar. Use it. I give this land to you. And again, David says, no way. I am not going to take from you what costs me nothing. So after much debate, they agreed upon the price, and the price was 600 shekels of gold. Now, let me tell you just how much this piece of property cost. Uh, according to the latest gold standard, if you will, the price of gold per ounce, 600 shekels of gold averages out to $365,000. For this piece of property. David definitely spent a pretty penny on this piece of land. The Bible says that David built the altar. He uh, presented that altar. He took the cattle. He cut their throat. He did everything he was supposed to do in making a burnt offering and a peace offering. He lays the body parts out on top of the altar, on top of the wood, and he doesn't light it. He presents the burnt offering. He presents the peace offering. And then the Bible says in verse 26 of 1 Chronicles 21, it says, the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. And then if you go into the next verse in, in chapter 22, verse 1 of chapter 22 kind of ends this particular story and instance. It says that when the Lord answered by fire and consumed the altar, consumed the sacrifice on the altar, David began again to offer his own sacrifices to the Lord. And then he says this in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 1. He says, Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offering for Israel. Now, I want you to understand this. David has been talking about building a house for God. And God, again, sends a prophet and says to him, You're not going to build me a house, but your son's going to build me a house. But instead of you building me a house... I'm going to build you a house. And he goes into this blessing that he places upon David. And so David now has, uh, by the fact that God received an offering, he sent fire down from heaven to consume. David looks at this land and he declares, this is the place where the temple is going to be built. This is the place where Solomon's going to build this temple. This is going to be the place where the altar is. This is going to be the place where worship happens, worship to the Lord our God. And so you might be thinking to yourself, what does this have to do with Pentecost? Because it really doesn't sound like there's much here to talk about when it comes to discussing Pentecost. Uh, but I want you to Look at this differently with me because I believe that there are ingredients that have been given to us here for a lasting Pentecost in our own lives. And, and, and so remember this, and if you hear nothing else, hear this. Where the fire of the Lord is, there the house of the Lord is being established. Where the fire of the Lord is, there the house of the Lord is being established. And so we can, on this day of celebrating Pentecost as Christians and celebrating as believers, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we can be reminded that fire from heaven on a vessel is a declaration that the house of the Lord is being established on that vessel. 
Now, you can get this one for free. What that means is, is you who have been baptized in the Spirit of God, you who are seeking the baptism in the Spirit, uh, as you've been reading, maybe you've been reading through Scripture and, and you're hungry for that new place, that next step with the Lord, know this, that the fire of the Lord that Jesus talks about, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit into the life of the believer is an establishment of the house of the Lord within you. That's powerful enough, right? I could probably sit there and preach on that all day long and we would just jump and shout and get excited. But there's more that I want to share with you. See, there's some ingredients here for us to realize this lasting Pentecost in our lives. Firstly, there is a cost. There is a cost. Can I tell you that the baptism in the Holy Spirit, there is a cost with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, for most of us, it is always going to be a cost of surrender. Surrender of some kind. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our lives. We surrender our unforgiveness. We surrender our bitterness. We allow the, the Lord to remove those things which have tainted us with sin. We remove sin in our lives. There's always a surrendering cost when it comes to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the 120 that were in the upper room had received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They believed in Him. They saw Him raise into heaven. They believed the word of God. They had surrendered their hearts to the instruction of God to wait for the endowment of power. This was no longer their will being done. This was now the will of God being done. The cost is surrendering to the will of God. Can I tell you that that is not always easy, but when we begin to put ourselves away, when we begin to put our will away, and we surrender ourselves to the heart, to the will of God, I, I can tell you it opens the floodgates of heaven. God will pour out His Spirit upon an open vessel surrendered fully to Him in every way. Secondly, there's a sacrifice. There's a sacrifice to this. Now understand, it's not a sacrifice that you make. It's a sacrifice that has already been made. Jesus is our absolute, our ultimate sacrifice. You might say, well, what do you mean by that? Jesus paid it all. He took care of all of it for all of us. Man was separated from God. Jesus came down as God in the flesh and was crucified and died and he rose again on the third day. And when he's sitting around the campfire after his resurrection, he's talking to all of his belie those who believed in him, those who followed him, his disciples, and even those 120 who met in the upper room. And he declares to them, I have made the ultimate sacrifice. I've paid the price. I'm going to the Father. And when I go to the Father, my Father will send the promise which is the Holy Spirit, all because sacrifice had already been made. Jesus paid the price for your baptism. All we do is surrender our hearts and surrender our minds because we've already been covered by that sacrifice of Jesus. So there is no other sacrifice that you have to worry about. There is no other sacrifice that you need to take care of. Jesus paid the entire debt so that you and I could be free from sin and so that you and I can be filled with the very Spirit of God where the tangible presence of God comes upon us and dwells in us and is establishing the house of the Lord inside of us. Man, that's good stuff. I know, you, I know it's good and I know you think it's good. Thirdly, and this is where we all start jumping and shouting, okay? So if you're new to watching this or you're new to Pentecost in any way, this is where you start jumping and shouting. We jump and shout because the price has been paid. We jump and shout because Jesus is our resurrected King. We jump and shout, listen, because there is a fire. I can tell you this, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a fire. It is a fire that comes from heaven. And the God who answers by fire from heaven to earth is the God who is establishing His house inside of you. And so when we look at Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost that we have already kind of talked about 
and that we read about in Scripture. When we're looking at Acts chapter 2, Acts 2 was the reset for the church. It was the reset for relationship with God. It was a renewed, a better promise, if you will. It was a reset of everything that had happened in the past. God hit the reset button. How do I know this? Well, uh, this, is, this is purely because when Jesus died on the cross, He said, it is finished. And at the time that He said it is finished, He bows His head. The Bible says He gives up the ghost or He dies right then and there on the cross. And it says that following the death of Jesus, darkness covered the earth for a time. There was a great earthquake. And the Bible says that the veil in the temple, now we're talking about the temple that David built, the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place or or from the holy place and the holy of holies, the veil had been torn in two. It was a sign that there was no longer a separation for man to be able to, to, to have to have a, a means for coming into the presence of God. Jesus paid the price. We can go whole, uh, wholeheartedly, humbly, and boldly into the presence of the Lord because the veil had been torn in two. And so this connection with God to be, had been established or reestablished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so we see that with the the, the veil being torn in two, it meant that sacrifice had had been made, that the price had been paid, and it sealed the deal. Now, the only sacrifice that the Lord has after this is this contrite heart. We've talked about it already. Our contrite heart, which believes in the power and the purpose of Jesus' sacrifice upon which fire should fall. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is now you've got this cost of surrender. You've got this sacrifice of Jesus. And when we embrace that sacrifice of Jesus, we take it to ourselves and we say, upon this sacrifice, I believe I am standing. And now God has a sacrifice to consume with his fire from heaven inside of you. And so there is a fire. God sends his fire from heaven. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that the believers, the 120, were in the upper room and they were all together in one accord. They were praying, had been praying for days, days on end, seeking the face of God, asking the Lord, send the Spirit of God, let it descend. And the Bible says that all of a sudden there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind and it says that fire fell and it broke off into smaller flames and it sat upon each one. A hundred and twenty little flames, almost like human candles, if you will, if you'll pardon that. But that's kind of the visual. There were small flames resting upon each and every one of those believers in that upper room. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the promise of God that He would send when Jesus had ascended into heaven. God would send the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit descended and He filled all 120 in that upper room. And the Bible says in Acts 2 that they were, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, it says that they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gave them the utterance. Side note, hopefully you were able to watch the video that I had posted last night on our Living Truth page, a discussion from our Assemblies of God leadership on Pentecost, on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in there, you'll see that former North Texas District Superintendent Rick DuBose starts talking about his experience with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. One of the things he says in there that was just so awesome, and I think it was very authentic for him to say this because I think that many times we as believers feel this same way, is that uh, when you hear that place in Scripture as the Spirit gave them the utterance, it almost makes it sound like the Spirit of God came down, grabbed their mouths, moved them around, and, and jostled them and, and, and made them speak. That is not how it worked. The Spirit of God spoke into their hearing. If you've ever had those moments where you hear yourself like talking to yourself, in those occasions, it's been my experience, it was former uh, District Superintendent Rick DuBose's experience, he said he heard words 
that were in the back of his mind. And he began to pray, Lord, if this is you, I'm going to say these words. They make no sense to me. I don't understand them, but I'm going to say them. And as he spoke those words out, he knew it was the Lord and they began to flow out of him. Jesus said, out of your belly would flow rivers of living water. You were getting a lot of extra stuff this morning, not in my notes, but I feel like I need to share this with you so that you have this understanding. Because I believe when all of this is said and done, if you are hungry for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you don't need me to lay my hands on you. You don't need the the great leadership of the church to lay their hands on you. You can be in your own home, sitting on your couch, in your favorite recliner, maybe at your desk as you're watching this, maybe as you're looking at it on the phone, and you can ask the Lord to send the fire into your heart and into your life and pay attention to those things. And as the Lord, by His Spirit, gives you the utterance, you speak those words out. The miraculous thing that took place after that is it says that all of these people from all around that region uh, surrounding Israel had come in for the celebration of Pentecost and they heard in their own languages they heard in their own languages 120 people speaking different languages and many in the crowd heard in their own languages the wonderful works of God I don't have time to get into all of the miracle that that is but I want you to know that in that moment when God sent the fire the fire the evidence of the fire was not just a burning passion but the evidence of that fire was the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I'm an Assemblies of God pastor. This is, a part, this is part of what we believe and I fully believe it because I've experienced it. Among all of those other friends of mine who have also experienced it, we can all say the same thing. The initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, of fire descending upon a vessel, establishing the house of the Lord, creating the new creation in Christ Jesus within you, and and all of that, the extra that God begins to send because He knows that in this day and time we're going to need it. The, uh, The physical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, of the fire from heaven coming upon the sacrifice of Jesus that is in your heart is speaking in tongues. Now, I want you to know, if you have questions about that, I want you to message me. Uh, You can can go to the LTFMP uh, or the the Living, excuse me, the Living Truth Fellowship uh, Facebook page and you can message me on there. You can message me at pastor at ltfmp.net. Uh, if you uh, have my phone number and want to text me, feel free to text me. I want to have dialogue with you on that. But I got to keep on going because while, and I've already kind of alluded to this, maybe a little foreshadowing with everything that I have said thus far, but so that you know that the last ingredient for fire to fall, now fire falls, because the co- there's a cost and the cost of surrender has taken place. The fire falls because there's a sacrifice that you have received in your heart. The sacrifice of Jesus that he paid the price for you. That's awesome. The fire falls because God answers by fire. Just as he did in Acts chapter 2. And again, if you read it in Acts uh, chapter 10. And throughout the book of Acts, various places where people were baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke with tongues uh, in their life, the evidence of the fire of God falling from heaven upon a heart filled with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But lastly, and here's, uh, here's what's awesome. There has to be a place. This story that we read in, in, in 1 Chronicles 21, there had to be a place established for the temple to be built. God already said a temple was being built. He already said who was going to build a temple. He answers, God, he answers David by fire, and David proclaims, here's where the temple's going to be. Here's where the sacrifice will happen. Here's where worship will take place. So we know, then, that there has to be a place. There has to be a place. But here's the kicker. God already had the place picked out. He'd already told David to go to Ornan and buy his threshing floor, which is kind of crazy. I've been to Israel. I've seen the the ruins of Solomon's temple. I've seen all of that where the second temple was even erected and all of that. I've, I've seen all of that area. So for that, I was standing on the place that David purchased for six figures from a man in order to establish the temple of God in that place, the house of worship 
for the house of Israel stood there. But God had already determined that that was going to be the place. And can I tell you this, as much as God has already chosen a place for his temple, in this day and age, we are, uh, can I tell you this, that he has already again picked the place out of where his temple is. And that place is you. You are the place he has picked out for his fire to dwell, for the sacrifice to be. You are the place he has picked. The Bible tells us, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, Do you not know that your body is the temple, there's that word temple, house of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. He continues to say, you've been bought with a price. In other words, Paul there in 1 Corinthians 6 is giving us the summation of what happened for David and what was prophetically declared by David, what happened in the book of Acts for uh, for us to read on the 120 disciples, followers of Jesus, what has happened in our lives today as we walk through this life and have engaged Pentecost or are looking to engage in a life of Pentecost. Know this, God had to have a place. You are His place place. He has set you up to be the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you will receive from God. Wow. We can celebrate Pentecost Sunday because when we have experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's God saying, that's my place. You are my house. You are my place. My spirit dwells within, not just rests on, dwells within, dwells within. Pentecostal people, it is time to rise up with the dwelling within of the Spirit of God. Can I get an amen? In fact, if you want to put it out there, you can text it, hashtag it, whatever in the comments, uh, uh, and and say it there. It's, It's all up to you, but let's celebrate Pentecost this morning. But you might say, so what's the point? Why, why talk about 1 Corinthians 21? Why talk about uh, uh, the, this whole baptism in the Holy Spirit? Why even celebrate Pentecost in this manner with maybe some teaching, some, some encouragement? Can I, can I tell you that you got to remember this. Pentecost originally was not just a day of celebrating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Pentecost was celebrating the beginning of the wheat harvest for Israel. It had been established back there in Exodus uh, when Israel had come out from captivity and slavery with Egypt. God established some, some, uh, some celebration times, and one of those celebration times happened to be Pentecost. It was 50 days after Passover, and it happened to be celebration of the beginning of wheat harvest. And, and not just the harvest as a whole, but the very beginning of of the wheat harvest. Pentecost marked the beginning of harvest. And so uh, we got to remind ourselves of this. Why is this such a big deal? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit is part and parcel to the harvest of souls in this day and age because his descending is still a celebration of the beginning of harvest, not the end of harvest. Harvest has not ended. In fact, for the last centuries, from the day of Pentecost through to even today, there has been a harvest that has been taking place and the Spirit of God has been upon it in all of its various forms. Can I tell you, why is this so relevant for us today? Because as we relaunch getting together and worshiping together, as the church has kind of had this relaunching of itself, this reset, if you will, I believe that Pentecost needs to be an absolute important moment in our lives, and it sets us on the right track. It gets us in the right direction, going in the right direction, because now we understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just so that I can wear a pin on my shirt and talk about it with only those who have received it. It's so I can live the effects of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And one of the effects is, is that I am now a harvester. I am now engaged in harvest time. Jesus said, look on the fields. They are white. They are ready to be harvested. We are still in those white 
ready for harvest fields. So the Spirit of God being upon us is important. It's absolutely vital to us so that we can move forward in the right empowerment that God had given us that Jesus spoke about before we ever embraced the Great Commission. He said, you're going to need power from on high for this to truly be the most effective thing that I have purposed for it to be. And so uh, we've got to remind ourselves, Pentecost will always be related to harvest. In our context, it's about souls. Pentecost is the boldness and the power for the work of the ministry, for the day of living in this day as a believer, in the craziest times we have ever lived in. Look, folks, I know that life is crazy. I know life is crazy. Let me say that again over here to this group. I know that life is crazy is crazy, that there is uncertainty, that there is uh, situations that are going on in our lives today, in our country today, in our world today that have thrown us off. And now more than ever, I believe that people are looking for answers. And you know what the enemy does? The enemy comes in and he stirs up the crazy. He stirs it up even more. Like we were all worried about one thing, and now we've seen another thing that has come up that has brought even more devastation to the people of God, that has brought even more devastation to people all across the world, devastation to the people of God because we're abhorred about what is going on in our, in our communities, in our society, in our nation. We should be not, uh, not put off by it. We should be concerned. And the Spirit of God in our lives is breaking our hearts so that we begin to walk into that harvest and see people healed, delivered, set free, saved by the power of Jesus Christ, by the power and the effectiveness of His sacrifice. Can I tell you, we need the Holy Ghost today, now, more than ever, simply because we're in the greatest days of harvest we could ever be in. Let that sink in for just a second. People are more ripe for harvesting today than they've ever been, but what they need is real. They need the real. They don't just need the hashtag posts. They don't just need the Instagram pictures. They don't just need the nice Facebook posts that talk about the goodness of God. They need to see the goodness of God in action. They need to see healing and miracles and power in action. And the Spirit of God in your life begins to bring those healings and miracles and power and brings it into action. He, if He is in you and He is changing you, you are evidence of the Spirit of God working in your life. And we are in that place where we now begin to share that that real life, that real truth, that real change, that real power with those who are around us. We are living in the greatest days of harvest we could ever, ever live in. And so with that, I, I've, I've probably said way too much uh, in this time, but I want you to not just take my word for it, Read it for yourselves. Go to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 10. Go to 1 Chronicles 21. You can go back to uh, Exodus and read about the, erect, the, the, the establishing of the tabernacle. God answered by fire on sacrifice. A place had been chosen. A place had been built. A cost had been paid. And the Spirit of God fell upon, the fire of God fell upon a sacrifice. You can go later on and see when Solomon built the temple, there was an altar that was built. The place had been determined because God had already said it and David had established it. The place had been built, the temple had been built, the altar had been built, the sacrifices were laid upon it, but no fire was brought because the fire's got to come from God. And God answered by fire. And he consumed that sacrifice. You can go to Elijah and look in, uh, in, in the, the prophets later in First and Second Kings. You can look at the prophet Elijah and see when he fought with the prophets of Baal. He said, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And the Bible says that they made an altar they, and, and, and Elijah rebuilt the altar of Israel and he laid upon it the sacrifice and he even did more. He poured water on it just to prove a point because he knew what God was going to do. And he said, and he prayed and he said, God, show who you are. And God answered by fire from heaven. Now, some of you may also uh, be questioning this. Again, I want you to contact 
me. Or if you know someone who is in our church or you have friends who go to uh, Pentecostal churches or you are just completely interested in, in understanding this even more, I want you to get a hold of me, get a hold of your friends. Uh, if they know me, get a, get a hold of me. Somehow I want to be able to have dialogue with you about this so that we can all be on the same page moving forward in the power of the Spirit together. And so let's start. Let's start today. You may be at home and you may say to yourself, man, I want this. Well, let me tell you, God has given us his word and his steps are very structured in here. Maybe you're at a place where you need to surrender. Do it. Maybe you're at a place where you need to set aside some hurts and some, some things that have kind of clouded you up and you need to get those things out of your heart. Go ahead. I want you to give those things over to the Lord. Maybe you don't know who Jesus is and you need to know more about that. I want you to get a hold of me about that as well. But maybe you do know Jesus. Maybe you have embraced the sacrifice. Know this, the sacrifice is the target for the fire of God to descend down upon. So I'm asking you, if you're sitting in your home and you're hungry, maybe you're hungry for more, maybe you need a, a, a refill. As Pentecostal people, we need to have refills. Maybe that's what you need. So I want you to go ahead, establish those things. God, send the fire once again. I'm going to pray here in just a minute, and I'm going to believe that God's going to visit you with fire from heaven upon the heart of sacrifice that you have in your, in your heart of hearts. I'm going to believe God that he's going to fill you. He's going to refill you. And I, get, and I tell you what, I want to see you this next week. I want to hear the stories of what God has done, how he lit you on fire with his fire from heaven. I'm so excited to hear what God has in store for us, to know what God has in store for us, to hear the heart of God for each and every one of you. And so I'm going to pray. Father, we love you today. And I pray on this great day of celebrating Pentecost, I pray, Lord God, that in each and every home this morning, Father, those who are hungry, those who need a refill, those who are hungry for a, 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 an initial infilling, I pray, Lord God, that you would send the fire upon the altar of sacrifice in their hearts today, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord God, that rivers of living water would begin to bubble up and out of every person in every home and everyone who is watching this video right now. I pray, Lord God, for a mighty encounter with you, with your presence, with your spirit, with your fire on this Pentecost Sunday. And so, Lord, I just bless this day and I thank you for this day and I pray for a great experience with you. And I pray, Lord God, that as we psych ourselves up and as we are getting ready to get together the, this next Sunday, I pray, Lord God, that you would meet us here in the church with your fire. Consume us, O oh God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves you. I love you. We'll see you next week.